the ocean and the atmosphere are coupled. And now the atmosphere is starting to respond. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, November 19th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. Just click the icon down there in the lower right-hand corner, the Storm Surf icon, and you can get subscribed. Also, if you'd like to make a small contribution, you can. Hit the special thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. With that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. Evolution Moto. Tim Caston. Thank you, Tim. You're always on it. Our Predicament. East Slate. And Matt Graves, pretty good contribution there. And Matt Rap F, off the charts contribution. Geez, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And now it's time to get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. And sure enough, we have a gale developing here in the Gulf with some sort of seas aimed towards the Hawaiian Islands and the U.S. West Coast. Uh, 26 to maybe 28 foot seas. We also have something trying to develop off Kamchatka. I think there's a lot more coming behind that, so we have a lot to talk about this evening. But first, let's dive into the current conditions. We'll start by looking at the buoys. Uh, we're looking up in Northern California, the Point Reyes buoy number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's currently hitting that buoy. Anywhere from 33.3 second period, really energetic swell energy, which a tenth of a foot, really not a whole lot. Down to five second period, just pure wind chop, unsurfable chop. And we see we got a bunch of energy somewhere in the 11 second period range. My guess is it's all pure, pure wind swell. Uh, in fact, let's take a look at this. Primary swell, 7.4 feet at 11.7 seconds from 310 degrees. That certainly smells like wind swell. And yeah, it says 8.6 feet. The surf's only about head high. That's pretty typical. Notice there's all this energy. There's wind swell. There's you know, a lot of energy over a broad area. We take just like a chunk of the middle of this and use that because you're not going to ride five second period wind chop at the same time you're riding 16.7 second energy. So it, it's a little bit of an average of all that. And then we go down to Southern California, uh, the furthest south buoy off of San Diego, 191 Point Loma South buoy, doing the same thing. We see little pockets of energy you know, in the upper period ranges, but mainly just wind swell in about the seven second period range. Primary swell, 3.8 feet, 7.8 seconds from 262 degrees. That's waist high surf. I think that's about right. Then we head over to the North Shore of Oahu, the Waimea Bay buoy number 106. Again, there's a sort of this profile of, let's say 11 to 12 second period energy there, but not a whole lot of size. Primary swell, 2.4 feet at 12.3 seconds from 286 degrees. That's waist-high surf, and that is about right as well. All right, so what's been going on for the past week? Well, this low, we're going back to last Sunday. A low started developing off of the Pacific Northwest, falling south, generating 22-foot seas as we got into Monday, and maybe 24-foot uh, seas into Tuesday off of California, but all aimed due south. A little bit of this energy was aimed at Hawaii, but really nothing at California. I think uh, the Hawaiian Islands got a little swell from that. But then that low basically vaporized as we got into Thursday. And then as of Saturday, this new little gale tried to start developing here north of the Hawaiian Islands. We're into Sunday morning, so today seas were 20 foot aimed south at the Hawaiian Islands, and I think we have one more frame there, just starting to build to 26 to 28 feet north of the, targeting primarily the islands, but you can see, get the idea, there's some fetch wrapping around the core here starting to be aimed at the U.S. West Coast, and that gives us hope for the future. And with that, let's start looking towards the future. We're going to start looking at jet stream level winds. These are winds up about 30,000 feet. And uh, we're looking for a trough. When they uh, form a trough, a dip to the south, that helps create low pressure in the upper atmosphere and down at the ocean surface. And of course, low pressure 
uh, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough, get uh, purchase on the ocean surface and generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, eventually turns into swell, and swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. But it is a trough, that dip, just like right there. That's what we're looking for. That starts the whole thing off in the upper atmosphere. We actually see a little bit, you can see a circulation there. You kind of get the sense of one there. Then you get the sense of one inland. That's the remnants of the low that was off our coast a couple days ago. So there is some potential there. And winds are blowing pretty good. So first we're going to focus on this trough here uh, due north of Hawaii because we know it's generating a low pressure system and that's supporting some gale formation. We also know, look at this, we have almost 190 knot winds pushing off Japan here. And they're generating something off of Kamchatka. But we don't think, well, you can see it right there. The, the center of the low just pushes north north into the Bering Sea. And the low here in the Gulf as we get into Monday uh, starts working its way north, still present even into Tuesday. But then as we get into later Tuesday, look at this, another trough is forecast. And this one's of pretty good interest because look at this, it's got a long bit. Of, the jet split here, but it starts consolidating as it approaches the date line digging out a nice trough, and that continues very broad as we get into Wednesday, Thursday, pushing into the Western Gulf on Thursday, and then weaker, but another trough forecast behind that, digging out, again, this more of a pinch trough variety as we get into Saturday. But the jet pretty consolidated, looking solid. And then even as we get into Sunday, well, that tr trough starts pinching off. But you see, you get the sense that the, the jet is poised to start wanting to really just roar off of here on about the 40 north, la north latitude line, pushing towards the U.S. west coast. In reality, we've got this kind of a ridge thing protecting California from what appears to be a building pattern over towards the date line. And we're going to get into that in a minute because there's some uh, found out foundational reasons to support the thesis that the jet is going to wake up big time as we get into the next several weeks. But we're going to hold that off till we get into the long-term forecast. All right, so let's go down to the surface. Surface level pressure, surface level winds. It is winds blowing on the ocean surface that generate seas, which results in swell. So the upper atmosphere is just sort of like the supply of fuel, the starting point, but it is what's going on at the surface here. So we see, of course, we have a gale north of Hawaii. It's actually a, really a storm. There's 50 knot winds right here. So 50 knot or greater is the... Uh, the threshold for being storm status. We also have a good low here off of Kamchatka, but this is of more interest right now. As we get into this evening, fully 50 knot winds aimed south and 45 knot winds aimed at the U.S. West Coast. This system up here just pretty much peters out. Monday, the gale continues and lifting northeast, but still producing 45 knot winds aimed at the U.S. West Coast. Another gale starts developing as we get into Tuesday morning, supported by a good upper level jet stream flow. Notice we have 55 knot winds forecast, and that's 48 hours out. So we're uh, you know, once you're in the five-day window, the model starts getting pretty pretty reliable. Still 55, almost 60 knot winds as we get into Tuesday night. And then it goes to 50 knots as we're into Wednesday. Fully a storm over a broad area aimed, I'd say, more at the U.S. West Coast than Hawaii. But we'll sort of keep our eyes on that. Wednesday, fetch continues. Thursday, we know there's a new trough building here. Winds respond in kind, still 40 knot. Then the thing starts fading out as we get into Friday. But that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, almost four days worth of fetch aimed at Hawaii, sideband energy at Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast. That certainly looks promising. It all fades out. We get into Saturday. and Notice just a light wind regime setting up for California and even the Hawaiian Islands. That's a good sign. And then we get into uh, 180 hours out. Another gale starts building over the date line. And there's a reason why the Dateline area is getting kind of interesting. We'll get into that as well as we get deeper into the forecast. So what are the effects of those winds on the ocean surface? All right, well,
Well, we know we have 26, maybe 28 foot seas already here. They're kind of pushing off to the north. Not great for swell production, but here we are into Monday morning, still 28 to 30. Now that says 32 there, but they're all aimed off to the north. It's right here. And there's even fetch here off Kamchatka too that should generate some small swell aimed at the Hawaiian Islands. The gale starts fading out. All these seas are aimed up at Alaska and uh, northern Canada provinces. The little bit here, that's what's aimed at uh, southeast and east. So uh, 26 to 28 foot seas sort of thing Monday night. And then that fades out. But Tuesday morning, here we go. Beginning of a storm with 48.2 foot seas right there on the date line. Tuesday, 18Z Tuesday. Now, this is a significant upgrade even from yesterday. We've been watching this storm, and it was supposed to have like 40-foot seas, 39-foot seas. But the latest runs have really just ramped this baby up. 48-foot seas on Tuesday sunset, up to 48.8-foot seas, 49 feet. Let's see, what's the scale here? Yeah, anything above 48 turns white. So this is Tuesday night, and then again, 47, almost 48-foot seas Wednesday morning, and then starting to fade down to 42 feet and below from there as we get into Thursday. Still, 36 hours of 40-plus-foot seas, something like that. Might have even been uh, 48 hours that is very promising and not even from tropical origins just pure storm activity and this is sort of the thing you would expect to see if just like the title of the video says if the ocean and the atmosphere is coupled in an el nino situation it's going to start having an impact on the jet stream and it certainly looks like that is beginning to happen with this storm this would be the second significant class storm if it develops of this season so far and we're you know not very far into the season and not deep into the el nino part of the season at all so uh that would be a good thing Moving on, we see a little gale trying to get organized off of the Kuril Islands on Sunday, but not really doing a whole lot. And then we take a little break. All right, local wind forecast. Hawaii right there, U.S. West Coast there, San Francisco there, Southern California down there. Northwest winds blowing a bit as of today. It was pretty junky in uh, anywhere north of Point Conception today. And we expect some of the same. There's our low building in the Gulf. Oh, and trades, uh, winds were out of the south for Hawaii, I think it was today. Tomorrow looks like kind of a, maybe a return to some sort of high pressure, but more northeast, so not great. Lighter wind regime for California. So we get into Tuesday, things really lighten up. Light offshore winds for California. Winds still eh, a little bit too northeast at 15 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Later in the day, turning to pure trades, light wind regime for California. Wednesday, light winds. We're liking this. And that would be about when that swell from the Gulf starts arriving in California. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands looking light. Now, Thursday on Thanksgiving Day, there is this high pressure thing forecast happening. It's actually maybe a good thing for California because I don't think there's any real surf forecast leftover gulf swell maybe but it gives you a guilt-free opportunity to enjoy your turkey with the family as it looks like it's going to be pretty much a blown out mess light trades for the hawaiian islands but come friday that high pressure pretty much disappear the winds from it pretty much disappear near shore for uh, north and central california especially later in the day Light southeast winds for the Hawaiian Islands. Saturday, this looks like north winds, but I think if you look at the local models, it's all forecast northeast. So pretty good thing for California. And a light wind regime for the Hawaiian Islands. And same thing on Sunday. Offshore, uh, San, not Santa Ana, but, you know, Santa Ana light for California. And uh, maybe some sort of something going on for the Hawaiian Islands here in terms of just maybe south winds. Let's see if we can stretch this out here. Uh, nope, pure north winds. Okay, either way, not so good. But anyway, in general, things looking pretty good other than Thanksgiving Day wind-wise for our main forecast area. Precipitation, well, we know we have high pressure over California, likely to stay. We're just going to blast through this. The Hawaiian Islands are here. I'm not really looking at them so much just because 
California is always very sensitive to drought. So we're just looking for any blue or snow or anything, and we're not seeing anything on Wednesday. Maybe a little dribble there Wednesday night into Thursday for North California, but that's all gone as we get into the rest of the holiday weekend. Clear skies, light offshore winds, not a bad setup at all. And if you don't have any rain, you probably don't have any snow. We're looking at uh, Palisades, Tahoe, Squaw Valley, no snow forecast. But uh, with the low off the coast and it moving onshore, it was at a day ago on Saturday, they s reported they had four inches. And they had, had, what, four inches a couple days before that. I mean, you go, the snow level is right at about eh, 7,700 feet. Um, was in, I was in Yosemite three days ago. We hiked up from the valley floor, and right at about the 7,700-foot line, it started turning, not solid white, but definite patches of, of broad patches of snow uh, on north-facing aspects, not deep or anything, a couple inches. But uh, up at Squaw, I mean, pretty much up top, it's white and almost looks skiable above 8,000 feet. You know, I don't really know that it is. You know, it's probably not deep enough, and there's probably a bunch of rocks and stuff. But it's moving in the right direction. I know that um, uh, uh, Mammoth is open for skiing. They got a good, uh, a broad coverage of snowmaking, so they have one or two runs open, something like that. But we're getting closer to that time. Now, we're going to look at snow levels here real quick. This is the base of Squaw right here. This is the summit up at 9,000 feet. We're just looking for the uh, the freeze level here, which would be right where the white starts. The gray is sleet. The red, if there were precipitation, that would be liquid precip. So, yes, it's cold right now, but as we get into tomorrow, boom, you see temperatures going right up way above the summit. And for the foreseeable future, basically above freezing temperatures the whole way out, no big surprise given high pressure over us, and it's not exactly like some cold um, Arctic high pressure, so uh, not unexpected for an El Nino winter. All right, let's do a quick look at surf forecasts. All right, so we know we have wind swell going on. That's going to continue into Monday and Tuesday. But here, right here, this little bump is, what, six to seven foot surf. There is a swell, that swell from the Gulf of Alaska forecast to come in. And then that big storm on the date line as we get into the weekend, waves forecast there building. Let's look at actual swell sizes. Okay, Wednesday, here's our little swell at four to five feet at 12 to 13 seconds and then here's your wind swell from the blow on christmas day and then as we get into the weekend four feet at 20 seconds going up to seven feet at 18 seconds sort of thing so you get the general idea that's exposed breaks in northern california swell direction on that given everything we're seeing right now 296 to 298 something like that down in San Diego, Channel Islands getting in the way. The Wednesday swell, much smaller, maybe two foot. There's your wind swell. And then a better promise out towards the weekend with the swell getting in. We'll take a look here. Yeah, the first swell on Wednesday, one foot at 12 to 13 seconds, something like that. But then we're into two to two and a half feet at 18 seconds. Uh, and some of that wrapping into exposed breaks in Southern California. And then we go to Oahu. Um, the swell, I think this is it right here, coming in, what, about two days earlier. 13-foot surf fading to 10 feet. That'd be like Monday, Tuesday sort of thing. And then a big pulse of swell, 20-foot Hawaiian as we get into Friday and then fading Saturday. Here you go, 10 feet at 13 seconds. That's good. I mean, a lot of fetch close to the islands aimed right at them. That hits Monday morning and dribbles down from there. And then the next pulse comes in Thursday night into Friday and you see 10 to 12 foot surf. I wouldn't be surprised if it's bigger than that though. Sometimes the models have a difficult time with these super high seas like 40 feet and above and the real long period energy. But again, we'll see. The storm hasn't even started to form yet. All right, let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the two main oscillations that affect our weather more in a couple weeks out? The MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, and the El Nino Southern Oscillation. 
All right, we're going to start by discussing or analyzing the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, this periodic weather oscillation that uh, rotates west to east around the planet on the equator. The active phase on one side of the planet, the inactive phase on the other. They rotate east to west around the planet opposite one another. The active phase is the one we're looking to. That's the good phase. That's like a low pressure system. When it moves over the West Pacific, because it's a low pressure, it acts like a chimney, sucks warm moist air from down on the equator up high into the atmosphere. The jet stream grabs that moisture. It supercharges the jet stream. A stronger jet stream creates troughs, which creates storms, which creates surf. Also, the active phase dampens trade winds in the West Pacific, and that can take warm water that's normally sequestered there and allow it to start moving to the east, not on the equator, but under the equator in what's known as a Kelvin wave, like a ball of warm water. It takes about four months for that ball of warm water to move from the West Pacific to the East Pacific, but eventually it erupts off the coast of Ecuador, creating a warm water slick. Then, so the active phase takes about four weeks to do its thing. Then the inactive phase passes by over another four weeks. Then four weeks after that, you get another active phase. It can create yet a second Calvin wave, and that will take, again, four months to make its way across the Pacific. The point being, during El Nino, this, uh, this active phase of the MJO sort of thing creates multiple Kelvin waves, successive Kelvin waves, and that's what actually fuels El Nino, the development of El Nino in the ocean, Make, taking all the warm water that's normally in the far west Pacific, pushing it east, changing the balance of warm water in the Pacific, and that drags the jet stream with it. That is, when the ocean and the atmosphere are coupled, that is, the ocean moves warm water to the east off of Ecuador, then the storm pattern changes in response to that. That's called coupling. And then once that happens, the jet stream starts changing, starts pushing more further south towards California, creating storms over the Dateline and pushing towards California. And that brings uh, snowfall and rain to California at upper elevations, and you get your classic El Nino kind of storm configuration. All right, so we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. This is data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific here. Zero, that's the equator. Dateline right there. We're just looking at the arrows for the moment. There's wind sensors on those buoys. These are five-day average winds. Winds are pretty strong out of the east, okay? Those are trade winds. Uh, moderately strong out of the east over the central Pacific, but notice this. Out of the west from, oh, I'd say 170 west. That's the beginning of what we call the Kelvin wave generation area. If you have westerly anomalies anywhere from 5 north to 5 south, and as far in the west Pacific as you can get to 170, just this side of the dateline, then you can end up with a Kelvin wave. This certainly looks like that sort of scenario. And look at this. You can't tell, but that's 31, 32 degrees centigrade water. That's very, very, very warm water. Normally, over here in the far west Pacific, already starting to move east, and we're going to see that that's having effects on the atmosphere above it as we get deeper into the presentation. Now, it's not the actual wind speed, it's the anomalies, different from normal for this time of year. We look at the winds here in the east Pacific, dead calm, new, not calm, but neutral, no anomalies. Now, last week, we had pretty strong easterly anomalies here. That has dissipated. Um... Water temperatures here. Notice this. It's saying two degrees the whole way out to two and a half degrees the whole way out to, well, almost the dateline. That is another very, very good sign in, in terms of El Nino development. We're not going to take this for gospel yet. But anyway, we're looking at winds here. Neutral winds, west anomalies, the whole way over the entire Kelvin wave generation area, over the dateline, making it to a point probably due south of Hawaii. This looks like a major westerly wind burst, classic El Nino in operation. Zonal wind anomalies for the past five days, okay? We're, uh, this is the whole planet, South America, Central America, Hawaii, where is it? Somewhere right up, oh, oh right there. Okay, New Guinea right there, the equator there, the dateline there. The oranges and reds, westerly anomalies. That's what we want. Those are associated with the active phase of the MJO, the active phase um, 
uh, reverses trade winds, trades normally out of the east. In fact, we see strong westerly anomalies here in the Kelvin wave generation area on the 13th of November, and actually westerly anomalies all the way to just about a point south of California. And there's those little easterly anomalies we saw off of Ecuador. Same thing on the 14th. The 15th, notice the easterly anomalies getting less pronounced. On the 16th, easterly anomalies all but gone. Westerly anomalies, wow, look at that, filling nearly the entire Pacific and continuing on the 17th. This is very good news. Talk about a bulldozer taking warm water and pushing it to the east. This is the poster child for that. The forecast for the next two weeks. All right, so this is the, the GFS model. This is actuals, what's happened. This is the forecast down here. This is the whole planet, though. The reds are westerly anomalies. The blues, easterly anomalies. Dateline running right up the middle here. Kelvin wave generation area, and we're very interested in creating Kelvin waves. It's the far west Pacific starts about 125 east, so right there. Okay, and goes to 170 west, just east of the date lines right there. So we saw back uh, in late October, we had a westerly wind burst. We had a little bit of pause for, what, a week? And then this big major, see that white in the center? Let's see if I can do this. There's the scale, completely off the end of the scale in terms of strength. Very strong westerly wind burst from pretty much the beginning of November, the whole way up to about today. Now that looks like the active phase of the MJO. And notice those westerly anomalies pushing their way across the Pacific. California is at 120 west and moving from there. Forecast to continue for about the next week. Then we get this little thing of easterly anomalies going for about two weeks, probably the inactive phase of the MJO. Then it looks like here we go again, maybe, maybe some westerly anomalies starting. So this assuming, and that's not even assumption, it's pretty much guaranteed. This is feeding the development of the seventh Kelvin wave of the year. Actually, this one already has created a Kelvin wave. This is just going to dump more warm water right into that same area and probably result in some massive kind of a Kelvin wave. If this is on the dateline here, it's still going to be three, two and a half to three months till it gets here. So November to December, January, mid February, you still have a Kelvin wave hitting the now. This El Nino that we're in right now, we are definitely in El Nino, and I, I've heard rumors, I haven't seen it myself, that uh, NOAA has officially finally declared that we're in El Nino, and all the data supports that. Before, it was just, we're forecast to have El Nino, you know, my hair's on fire, all that kind of thing, but now we're actually in a place where, yes, there is Lots of evidence to say, one, the ocean and the atmosphere are coupled. That's the first part you need for El Nino. When we got, we got the ocean signal, we have the atmosphere signal. We're going to get into the evidence of that in a minute. And now we're starting to see, just like the models are suggesting with the big storm building on the dateline, uh, atmospheric evidence of a change in the jet stream pattern supportive of an El Nino uh, uh, situation in the atmosphere. Okay, outgoing long wave radiation forecast, OLR. Okay, that's just fancy words for cloud cover, right? Okay, South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there, Dateline right there, Equator right there, Kelvin wave generation area right here. There's the last of our active phase, the MJO fading. This is cloudy skies, the blues, negative anomalies, meaning less sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface that's being uh, obscured by clouds. The reds means more sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface. That means cloud-free skies. So that would be the inactive phase, the MJO active phase. The active phase pretty much moving out of the Kelvin wave generation area, inactive phase moving in. And this is a statistic model. So the same pattern progressing eastward uh, through the next 15 days while the next active phase starts building over the Indian Ocean. The dynamic model, the GFS model, says pretty much the same thing, but the inactive phase about a week from now, that's about it, it starts fading and all down to neutral. I think this is probably more realistic given the El Nino base state that's right here. The inactive phase will hit, it'll basically just get sheared apart and it'll die, and then the next active phase pulls in behind that. Another view, upper level moisture. 
The oranges and reds, dry air. The greens, wet air. All right. South America, Central America, New Guinea there, the equator there, Dateline there, Kelvin wave generation area right here, West Pacific. So it says dry, and this runs about a week ahead. This is a statistic model. The upper level moves faster than the lower at atmosphere. So dry air, this would be your inactive phase already in. But as we get into about, you know, I don't know, the second week of December, here comes the next active phase, wet air pulling in. No big surprise. That continues into, I'm trying to look around the microphone here, towards the end of December and then another little dry thing. So we have this, you know, the MJO was dead. Now the MJO is waking up. It is either constructively, if it's an active phase of the MJO, constructively interfering or integrating with the El Nino base state over the date line. And then when the inactive phase comes in, it sort of, you know, dampens the machine for a little bit. But you'll notice as we get deeper into this, we're going to get periods of storms for two or three or four weeks and then It'll dry up for a little bit, and, and not only over the dateline in terms of surf production, but then that same pattern, theoretically, bringing moisture into California for a couple of weeks and things dry up, and then cycles of storms, all driven by the MJO and enhanced by El Nino. Oh, and I forgot to show you this before. This is the phase diagram. So where the active phase of the MJO is and how strong it is. This is the statistic model here. This is the, the uh, dynamic model here. How do you read this? Well, th this just shows you where the active phase is. So the heavy dot is where the active phase is right there. But so the MJO moves west east from the Indian Ocean to the Maritime Continent over the West Pacific to the East Pacific under the United States, over the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The dot right here, pretty much over Africa. Here's the one, two, th uh, whoops, sorry, one, two, three forecast tracks. Per the statistic model, they all put it over the Indian Ocean, ranging from very weak to moderately strong. The GFS model has it moving east over the maritime continent and very weak. See this circle here? If the, if the forecast track is inside or on the circle, it's considered very weak. So same thing here with the dynamic model, in the circle of death and of no real interest. All right, so let's look out a month now. The CFS model goes out a month. The GFS only goes out two weeks. Again, this is 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies, the east-west component of the wind. So that's up about 4,700 feet, but a pretty good rough approximation of what's going on down at the surface. All right, so let's see. Dateline runs right up the middle here. Far west Pacific, 125 east. So here, all right, now. The uh, the oranges and the reds, westerly anomalies. So you can see here was the beginning of our west, one westerly wind burst, another in the beginning of October, building into a stronger one in October, in later October, with a, the solid contour, just a hint of the active phase. And then as we get later into October, early November, boom, the MJO finally wakes up, reemerges. Not strong, but it's there. Dotted contour, inactive phase of the MJO, and you see the little shades of easterly anomalies. And then here is our current active phase of the MJO, not particularly strong. But look at the massive westerly wind response. Now, remember, El Nino, the base state of El Nino is right here over the dateline, which acts like a low pressure system as well. So you have the low pressure from the MJO marrying up, see that purple line there, with the El Nino base state, which is low pressure, and that supercharges it. You end up with that big westerly wind burst. Then here comes our inactive phase. Phase. It's going to try to get going, but I think uh, the El Nino base state is pretty much going to cut it out. It'll last for maybe two weeks. And then here comes our next, next active phase of the MJO and westerly anomalies and maybe another westerly wind burst. Also of note, this guy here, a week before it happened, the models were completely clueless about it. And then it just woke up and it blew the models away. That's the kind of thing you really want to see from El Nino because the models, you know, they're made for average conditions. But we're, we're during El Nino and stronger El Ninos, you're kind of not in average conditions or normal. Things are beyond the norm. So the model has a hard time figuring it out. This guy came along and just blew the model away. But that's a good thing. I'll take that any day of the week. Before we get to the next model, we're going to go look at outgoing long wave radiation actuals. That is cloud cover. Okay, uh, this is on the dateline. There's the dateline right there. 
far west pacific 125 east so right there uh this is uh oranges and reds are cloud free skies okay and the blues are cloudy skies so you can think of the reds as downward falling air okay and the blues as upward moving air the dry cold air from aloft falling down it splits when it hits the ocean surface and then goes east and west and then rises dragging warm moist air up with it creating clouds now this was during la nina last year so this is all over the maritime continent here not in the pacific that was the dominant mode of operation in the pacific just dry air high pressure locked over the dateline till about may of this year and all of a sudden boom that just dissolved and notice the blues here they started seeping little bit at a time even in july they were making it to the dateline we called this the pause or the stall in el nino development because we couldn't really see, we couldn't see what was coming in the future we saw bits and pieces of upward sucking air on the uh, dateline which you'd want to see during el nino the walker circulation moves we've talked about this in past videos so i'm not going to get too deep into it tonight but now with the latest bit of data you can see clearly what was Dry air in the Pacific, wet air over the maritime continent has switched completely. It's bone dry air over the maritime continent and very wet air over the dateline. So this clearly looks like a coupled, the ocean has done its thing, and we're going to go look at the ocean temperature data. But when you see the signal in the atmosphere, that means the ocean and the atmosphere are coupled. And then once you get this, then the jet stream starts what moving through this area getting supercharged with all that wet moist air heading right for the u.s west coast and the gulf of alaska feeding storm development and doing the classic el nino kind of magic or at least that's what we hope all right so with that then we go look at out this is says you but it's outgoing long wave radiation forecast same sort of deal the blues are wet air the oranges and reds are yellows dry air now this is what's happened in the past you can see this was Ju july of last year when the blues started oh and the dateline runs right up the middle here far west pacific right about there you see the building dry air pattern here over the maritime continent this is what's happened the forecast up here the building blue pattern and then you look forward it's just rock solid uh storm feeding machine on the well the dateline is right there actually a little bit east of the dateline and drifting to the east at the end here where's that at roughly um it's hard to do i'd say about 150 so due south of hawaii okay and then you see the dry air starting to actually work its way into the west pacific but over the maritime continent this is the classic el nino pattern everything starts out in the dateline and then it starts drifting east from there all right that's so this is we looked at the outgoing long wave radiation forecast or, or actuals this sort of is another depictation of that now let's overlay here we go down at the surface 850 millibar zonal winds all this matches up exactly so here's our big west the oranges and reds westerly anomalies the blues easterly anomalies dry air wet air here and you see so here's our current one two weeks looks like of the inactive phase of the MJO and then boom we're right back in business for pretty much the whole month of December and beyond now this model again I said it doesn't really have a clue and it doesn't it didn't really see this guy and didn't see it nearly as strong as it was who knows the model every every time I look at this two weeks out it's coming it's coming it's coming and you all have made comments in the comment section and it never comes but it does, but it's only kind of random luck. The model doesn't really have a handle on it. So I'll take this with a major grain of salt, but it looks like, you know, just knowing the MJO sort of thing, it's, let's say, three, two to three weeks on, two to three weeks off. This would be about right if you were just making a random guess of when the next active phase of the MJ would show up. Let's overlay the MJO. Here we go. All right. This is the inactive phase, the dotted contour. So here it says we're in the active phase, but 
kind of grossly under misrepresents represents it. Here's your inactive phase with your easterly anomalies, and then you get into about the first week of December. Here we go, active phase, big active phase, whole bunch of hoopla. Who knows what's really going to happen? We'll watch it. And then inactive phase beyond that, and then things start mellowing. That said, this El Nino is a very, very late bloomer. It's just... I mean, normally you start getting towards peak El Nino, at least in the ocean sort of thing, right around between now and Christmas. Um, I think it's going to be later than that, and you'll see why. There's a there's some major stuff going on in the ocean. It's just starting to happen now. This this active phase of the MJO was the first real solid sign of here we go. El Nino is happening, and it's getting some attitude. And then let's overlay the low pass filter here. This is that low pressure bias, the El Nino base date. The solid contour here, low pressure. There's the date line. It's set up with four contours and expected to hold for the foreseeable future. This would be the center of storm generation right there. Where is that? About 170 west and pretty much holding according to this. But notice easterly anomalies making more an incursion into the west pacific as we get into the beginning of january and westerly anomalies moving more off to the east that's pretty typical of el nino and what you want to see as the center of the storm generation machine moves closer to california all right subsurface water temperature anomalies this is data from the TAO buoy array. There are buoys strung across the equator. They're anchored to the sea floor. They're used for monitoring El Nino. These are the actual anchor lines, and on those anchor lines, there are sensors. Sensors collect data supplied to a model. Notice there's big gaps here between the sensors, and some of the sensors, like right here, aren't working. But the sensors are there looking for Kelvin waves. Again, there's balls of warm water driven by the active phase of the MJO that start moving off to the east. So, and here, clear as day, 30 degree anomalies. So, uh, God, when was it? Months ago. That wasn't even on the chart. It's here. And a little bit of time, this pocket of water. Now, this is not a Kelvin wave. This is sort of like the, the home base for the development of Kelvin waves, right on the dateline, 30 degrees. That's very warm water. The leading edge of this was back at I think it was 167 last week. It's now to about 163. The center of warm water moving to the east, being driven by these continual Kelvin waves. We'll see more about that in a minute. The 29 degree isotherm right here at 153. I think it was back at 156 last week. The uh, 28 degree isotherm wall is it like 140 or 139 last week it's moving off to these all this says is piles of warm water is moving our way and where there is warm water and we're going to get talking into exactly how warm this water is but that supports evaporation and that becomes the center for the el nino machine now the 24 degree isotherm is actually has actually gotten shower the la shallower the last week. That's because we had easterly anomalies here. We got some upwelling thing going on. When you look at the sea surface temperature anomalies, you're going to see they don't look as spectacular as they have, but that is very short lived because we know now know the active phase of the MJO and westerly anomalies are moving all over this area, and that's going to just light up the warm water temperatures on the surface being fed by warm water coming from underneath. In fact, let's take a look here. It's not actual water temperatures that matter. It's the anomalies, difference from normal for this time of year. And again, this is this is looking really, really good compared to a month or two ago. I mean, we have five degree centigrade anomalies here from in four degree from like Ecuador the whole way out to, well, where is that? That's like one... 150. So that's Hawaii there. And then here's our next Kelvin wave building. Been watching this. It started as just this little pocket of maybe one degree anomalies. Now it's two degree. Now it's three degree with a pocket of four degree right there. I mean, this is a, it's really a Kelvin wave generated by two active phases of the MJO in October and early November. A lot of momentum behind that. That's gonna, and we have five degree anomaly here. That's all working its way up to the surface. This is, three months or more of warm water. Again, what would we say? Uh, November to December, January. 
February at least, probably March, at least a pocket of warm water just and the more it starts bleeding up here off of Ecuador, the more it feeds the movement of this pocket of warm water to the east, which feeds the jet stream pushing into California, which feeds the storm machine and all the good things that we normally expect from El Nino. All this, I mean, I don't really have anything bad to say. Everything is looking really good at the moment. Here's data from another source, but it's telling the same picture. A big Kelvin wave that starts like 150 east the whole way over the date line, making it. Now, this has the leading edge of it actually at 140 west or so. And the pre existing warm pool right here. I mean, months of warm water, all looking fantastic. This is the satellite data used to build that last chart, just showing you the uh, ocean height. Okay, higher oceans mean warmer water at depth because warm water expands. It pushes the ocean surface up. You, see, you have a satellite pass over here, strip out the wind waves, the tides, and the swell and all that. You see it just confirms a massive area of warm water from, well, there are date lines right there. The equator's there. So out 160 east, the whole way into Ecuador, the Galapagos right there, and it's like a wall of warm water hitting here, vecting north and to the south. Classic El Nino kind of setup. Sea surface temperature anomaly, not subsurface, surface. And these are not temperatures. These are the anomalies. Uh, South America, Peru, Ecuador, um, uh, Central America there, Hawaii there, equator right here. You see, and, and this is just qualitatively looking at it, a steady pool of warm water. The official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region, starts at 120 west. So from here, 5 degrees north and south of the equator, out to 170 west, which is here. And now I can honestly say we have a homogeneous supply of warm water filling the entire Nino uh, 3.4 region and still looking pretty solid here. Now we know there were easterly anomalies over this region. If you've been following this chart, we had deeper red blotches all out in here. They've kind of dissipated some. I think they're still there. It was just a function of the easterly winds. That's all died down in this area. And I think you're going to see some darker red starting to pop up here in the next week or two as the active phase of the MJO moves over this portion of the Pacific now. But what this suggests is the pool of warm water is growing in aerial coverage almost out to the dateline, exactly what we'd expect to see in a developing El Nino. Sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days, last week and the week before that, see the blue there, that'd be colder water. It was over a pretty good area right here, those easterly anomalies we were talking about. This is the last little bit of it, all getting stamped down. You already see the beginnings here of warm water si signal building from Ecuador the whole way out to the dateline. This whole area, I think, is getting ready to really light up. During normal El Ninos, it would already be lighting up like a month ago. Again, the character of this El Nino, every El Nino has its character. This guy is slow moving, hesitant, but he has pile, he or she or they, has piles of energy and momentum behind it, and that energy will not be denied. The atmosphere has a lot of latent heat that it needs to vent out. El Nino is the way the Earth does that, and it's going to happen. It might not happen exactly the way the models say or the way we think it is, but it looks like it's going to happen, and it's happening now. Here's the backed off view. Now, here we don't have our deep reds that we had you know, two weeks ago, but we see the development of moderate reds over the entire, from Ecuador out to the dateline. I mean, classic El Nino. I just want to see this really start getting deeper red here. We know we have all the warm water at depth. Massive Kelvin wave activity going on. Maybe yet a Kelvin wave number eight developing, if you believe the CFS model. So I think we have plenty of time here. Um, you just have to be patient, I think, is the nature of this one. This guy's going to light up. It's just a matter of when. Sea surface temperature trend in the Nino 1.2 region. This is the area right there along Ecuador and uh, the Galapagos Islands. Certainly a downward trend. 
Not abnormal for this development in El Nino. Typically, it lights up first there along Ecuador, and then all the warm water gets caught by the trades and starts moving out into the Nino 3.4 region. So, oh, so we're down at plus 1.129, but this is actually two tenths of a degree below normal. So, I mean, just this this data source is not as good. So, it's probably about 1.3, but still a downward trend. But the Nino 3.4 region, talk about a dramatic upswing, plus 1.677, up from about 1.25 or something like that. So a big upward climb underway right now. Here's data from another source, and you want to talk about an upward climb lately. So here we are up to nearly two degrees. What is that? What? 1.98 Two degrees is super El Nino status, but you got to be there for three consecutive months. And this is, we're approaching it for one day. We're not saying that is the case, but we're moving in a good direction. The weekly OISST data. Now this is saying, so this, I think it should have updated by now. We're, the, we're It's like uh, 11 days behind. So, but my guess is the number is probably at least 1.8, if not 1.9 for this week. You see, this is the Nino 3.4 region. You can see the steady upward trend while in the Nino 1.2 region, the steady downward trend. All right, sea surface temperature anomalies. This is the past one year trend. East Pacific here, West Pacific here. You can see a year ago, here is your La Nina signal, colder than normal water in the East Pacific, all warm water sequestered in, at the surface over here. But then as we go over time, you can see, you can't see the actual Kelvin waves. What you see is the eruption of the Kelvin waves and that warm water slowly getting dragged east by the trades. The good news here is I've been waiting for this. One, two, three, that fourth shade of orange right there, it now fills the entire Nino 3.4 region, which starts here and goes out to about, uh, where is it? Right about there. I think that's 180 there. And that shade of orange is one and a half to two degrees. And where is the two degree shade? The two degree shade is right here working its way in. Will we get this whole region filled with two degree anomalies? <laughs> That's kind of the guess. I, I hope it's so, but I don't know that it's going to, but we'll see. Either way, this is looking really, really good at the moment. Here is our sea surface temperature anomalies. I'll pull this down so you can see it right here for 2023. All right. Looking pretty good. We're going to do our usual comparative analysis here. So next up, this is the one for 2015 for the same date. You see, it was a lot warmer and over a broader area and cooling here off of Ecuador. And then for 1997, even warmer still. Oh, and there's the tag so you can see it. I'm not, I'm not going to deny you the opportunity to verify the date. So this year compared to 97 is very moderate compared to, yeah, and compared to 2015, not as strong either. But I say that, and this one isn't forecast to get super El Nino. Uh, the 2015 went super El Nino. 97 was the classic super El Nino. But uh, I haven't completely given up the ghost that this thing might uh, outperform what uh, most people think it will do. But it's only going to be a matter of time. All right, so what does the atmosphere think is going on? We know things are happening subsurface. We know they're happening on the surface. We also know that in the atmosphere, we have that big uh, outgoing long wave radiation thing going on on the date line. So the atmosphere is responding. Another way to look at this is the Southern Oscillation Index, the difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. When pressure is lower over Tahiti, as it would be during the active phase of the MJO or during El Nino, the index goes negative. Negative, but today's value is positive. It's neutral, 1.65, and was basically uh, the past three days have been neutral. Now, during that big pulse of the active phase of the MJO, see how we, I mean, we were negative for quite a uh, quite a good little run there. Today, this suggests that the 
inactive phase of the MJ was starting to set up. We'll see how positive we get, but I bet you not very much. 30-day average minus 8.58. We went down to 10.43, and this is going to continue to fall because this is a 30-day, so it's a lagging indicator. But we want to see this down at like minus 25 if you're in like a super El Nino status. Probably won't get there, maybe minus 20. The 90-day average uh, during Super El Ninos goes to like minus 15. We're at minus 10.8, not bad. And we've been hovering well, right around where we are now for a month. Let's look at all this on a graph. Here's the 30-day moving SOI graphed out. Okay, right there, like minus 10 sort of thing. When you're positive, that's La Nina. When you're negative, El Nino. The downward spikes are the active phase of the MJO during La Nina here, and the upward spikes are the inactive phase during La Nina back in 21 and 20, uh, 2022. The inactive phase has dominated the active phases. Now in 2023, we're the opposite. The active phases are dominating the inactive phases. We expect this to start falling more neut more lower uh, deeper into negative territory. I think as we get into January and February, you're going to see this thing really starting to crash. But for right now, we're sort of hanging there, still waiting for this to respond. Sea surface current, and this speaks to the Walker circulation, the change in circulation over the Pacific. So we have right on the equator here, that's what really matters, the easterly current pushing off of, oh, there's Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands. But then as you go over, we're going to the far west Pacific here, okay? There's the uh, maritime continent here, New Guinea there. Look at the westerly anomalies, just massive. And the dividing line between the, the two competing currents, I'm guesstimating somewhere right about here, and that's 175 west. Now here's something I want to show you that some folks have been talking about. Uh, it's not the sea surface temperature anomaly so we could we could do that let's do that first okay this depicts and you can't really tell i mean it looks great on the scale but i have no real idea how well actually you can click it here let me see if i can get it. you can get spots of temperature anomalies three degrees above normal 3.3 3.4 you can't see the numbers are off the screen here but i 2.8 2.8, 2.7, 2.2, and where are we? Uh, one, 3.2 there. Notice there's a pretty big pocket of warm anomalies right here. Okay, and then we're out of the uh, Nino 3.4 region. So this makes it look like temperatures are like super El Nino status, but they're not. So we're going to take that with a grain of salt. But what we are going to look at here is actual sea surface temperatures so let's go here you can give that a second to catch up so there's uh ecuador um, um galapagos islands and you see sea surface temperatures i think i can actually yeah 26 this is centigrade 26.1 and i can't do all the conversion in the top of my head but you see this massive ball of warm water right here and i think if i can 31 degrees centigrade okay west anomalies there east anomalies there super warm water sucking and evaporation going straight up remember the walker circulation and the outgoing long wave radiation that we were looking at before all centered right about on the dateline right above this pocket of warm water here 31 degree centigrade that i did the conversion on i think i i thought i found a 32 out here somewhere but this equates to roughly 87 degrees fahrenheit that is very warm water sitting right on the equator that certainly will support some evaporation and this ball of warm water driven by westerly anomalies will only start moving off to the east we expect it to get somewhere south of Hawaii as it does that that will drag the center of storm production we'll play this game it'll cause the jet stream to dip well right where that warm water is we know we have a mega storm set up for the dateline in the next four days due north of that pool of warm water as el nino gets more built into the atmosphere the dip will get more pronounced it'll sort of get in a cycle and then as the warm water moves 
closer to the U.S., the dip will get closer. The jet stream will come further south. We get these. I get a lot of these questions: that when will it rain in, let's say, southern Arizona or you know, uh, New Mexico or whatever? And it's really a function of well, where does the jet stream? How far south does the jet stream come in multi successive atmospheric river events that we're expecting to have happen? Now, this is not a super El Nino, so. I'm kind of thinking the main focus of the jet stream will be between, I'll say, Point Arena and Point Conception and the states that are along this path, you know, where is that? Uh, 34.55 degrees north. So right along, no further south than that line there. So it depends where you live as to where the impacts will be and precipitation will be. The super southern tier states, Given this isn't a super El Nino, probably they're not going to see as much precip as if you're north of the Point Conception line going across the country. All right, we're going to do this real quick, and then we're moving on. This is the last uh, page in this thing. Um, this is the model projections from October. The November update should be coming probably tomorrow or the day after. So you can see here pretty clearly the dynamic average was right about, of all the dynamic models, right about 2 degrees, which is the threshold for Super El Nino. And that's not a peak temperature of 2 degrees. That is a three-month running average. The statistic model, where are they? 1.37. We're going to go look at the data down here. So this is all the dynamic models. Notice those are three-month running averages. And you can look at some of the models. We, we've been focusing on the CFS model right here, which has 1.59. It depends which version you're looking at, but peak temperature is 1.59. But look at all these other models, 2.3, 2.5, all above the CFS model. And those are three-month running averages. The average of all the dynamic models right at two degrees. That's right at the threshold being before being uh, strong El Nino going into super El Nino. We'll see whether we get there, but right now it kind of looks like that's happening. But I don't think it's going to happen in the November, December time frame. I think it's going to be more like here or even in here, but we'll see. Um, the statistic models, of course, a little bit more conservative, 1.8, 1.76 or so. So we'll see. The models have their idea of what's going on, but I think this El Nino has a trick up its sleeve, and it's not going to do exactly like any of the models or a consensus of, it, of any of the models are saying. So the really good news is, boom, we have a strong storm forecast for the dateline for producing surf. The second one of the season, and not just, you know, kind of a garden variety, a really solid 46-foot seas for like 36-foot hours aimed reasonably well at Hawaii and right at the U.S. West Coast. And my guess is, as we get deeper into the weeks ahead, that's going to become a semi-common occurrence. And the center of those storms is going to start moving closer to Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast as the jet stream starts getting more dug in and affected by that massive pool of warm water that's sitting down on the equator right on the dateline. This is the beginning, I think, of the real uh, um, fruition of an El Nino pattern in terms of not just theoretical, but we're getting, you know, in terms of swell production. And at some point, eventually, as the jet starts pushing into the coast, uh, uh, rainfall into California and the southern tier states. So things are looking really good. Really looking forward to see what the comparative model is going to say this coming week. But as of right now, this El Nino is looking solid as a strong El Nino and starting to make its mark in the atmosphere. All right, that's the video for this week. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up. If you have a comment or question, write it up. We'll, be, uh, we'll try to respond. If you would like to make a small donation, you can. If not, please subscribe. Click the Storm Surf icon down in the bottom, the right-hand corner of this window, and you can get set up so you can get subscriptions. And other than that, happy Thanksgiving. It looks like we got something to celebrate. Swell possibly on the way. The video for next Sunday, I'm not sure whether we're going to do it or not. I mean, uh, just having family in town and trying to enjoy a little downtown. But if I don't do it on Sunday, maybe we'll do it on Monday. Anyway, so that's the video for this week. We'll do it again, maybe a day delayed next week. And other than that, have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next time.